Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Today, my guest is Whitney Jude. Whitney is a health and fitness expert and nutrition coach. Whitney owns and runs her own business and helps people in person and online get healthy and find their focus and passion with a long, sustainable lifestyle. I'm excited. Hello, Whitney. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, Again, uh, just thank you for uh, the courage and the willingness to share your story. so that it can make a difference, hopefully, for someone else out there in a similar situation. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So we're going to deep dive back into childhood, which can be obviously sometimes intense and confronting. Um, But we're just going to have a simple conversation around what I call this. We have this series called, you know, in this case, Whitney Turned Out, meaning whatever you went through, uh, having been diagnosed or labeled or gone into deep spaces, deep spots in life, you've come back around. You've turned out because you're now uh, an adult running your own business. You're a very positive person, very inspiring person. You are someone who continues to challenge yourself and transform yourself through uh, work. That's where we met, uh, transformational work. And so I just am excited to see how did you go from, and we'll dive back there, from a child that was essentially labeled or called disordered to becoming a functioning, successful, thriving, fulfilled um, adult. So why don't we dive in? Why don't you take us back to, uh, can you remember sort of early memory when you first felt like people were maybe saying, or you felt like something was wrong with you or you were different or something was up? Yeah, so I actually had this revelation back not even like two months ago with my mindset coach. I was just like, this was my aha moment. Um, it was in kindergarten, first grade, because I had to do the first grade twice because I wasn't able to read. Mm. And um, that's where I was first labeled with some type of disorder and learning disabilities and that is what led my parents or my mom to put me into therapy to figure out what's going on why can't she learn why can't she pass any of her tests or excel and um the doctor diagnosed me with add and then i was also diagnosed with depression at like five or six years old. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) And do you you remember, I know that's early on, I wouldn't personally remember that far back, but do you remember how it felt when you were going through that, that sort of testing doctor or something's up? Do you remember an emotion, a feeling or anything that comes up? Uh, I do remember the testing a little bit because I was so scared to get the wrong answer. Cause that's what I was used to. I always got the wrong answer. <laughs> so. That's an interesting point. Actually, if you think about a child sitting there, trying being nervous on top of just being who they are and having the friction with the world around them, having that nervousness and that pressure to perform that test right when they're already not performing in school. I mean, I just, I don't know. It just dawned on me. That's an extra added layer of, of stress, you know? Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and so from there, there was ADD because you weren't hyperactive. You weren't the girl that would jump up and fast talk and crazy distract, right? Not at all. I was just always super calm and couldn't pay attention for the life of me, but I was <laughs> super calm. <laughs> wow. So, so that was it, like you said, five, six when yep. you were diagnosed. And then uh, what was, what was sort of given as a, as a solution or what, what, uh, what were your parents told and how to treat it or how to move forward, how to cope, as they usually say, with it? Yeah, so I remember the first, one of the first things that I was prescribed was antidepressants. And I don't remember exactly why, 
or what they were put me on, but that's one of the first things I remember. And then, um, I just, I, gosh, I remember being on countless different prescriptions for years and years and finally finding one that works for a little bit, or I don't remember that much about that. And, and that was mainly for depression. Yeah. And did that, uh, I can't imagine that that would help. I mean, did that help with the ADHD? Was it sort of like, let's try that first? No. They tried that first and the learning was still a struggle. And then they put me in additional testing. And that's whenever I was diagnosed with ADD. And um, then I was put on Adderall. For, say, like a few few years in eight yeah. seven eight something like that yeah yeah and then how long were you on Adderall uh through college wow so yeah. we're talking 10 years yeah wow and how do you remember your childhood or how do you remember that affecting you I mean there's a, it's a multifaceted question right do you remember any kind of emotional or physical, uh, let's call it a disruption or a change. And then the second one will be more like, uh, you know, what was the experience like going into college, knowing that you're kind of dependent on, so I don't want to lead you here, but, or I should say, did you ever feel the second part would be, did you ever feel dependent? But let's, let's pause that for a second. But yeah. Did you feel anything different in your body, physical, um, any, any, any struggles with medication? throughout your childhood? Uh, I did feel like I needed it so that I could go into class and I could actually comprehend what was going on. Like I could actually sit there and not just doodle for the entire session, but I would actually be able to focus and take notes. And without that, and I you did. Couldn't. And I struggled without, I struggled without it, but it was just like a constant, I do remember taking the Adderall and it would change my mood. It would make me grind my teeth. It would have a come down from it. So I would be good. And then my come down would just be so depressing. <laughs> and that's probably where the antidepressants came in to help. And it was just one big vicious cycle. It was a cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> And so I can relate because for our project, I took Adderall for about a month, uh, maybe two months ago, three months ago, and I already grind my teeth. I'm already kind of have anxiety, thanks to my mom, no hard feelings, but that's where it comes from. And so I would grind my teeth late into the night. I would be super, you know, I got to figure some stuff out. So I can't imagine, I'm, I'm, I'm 50. So for me, it's like, okay, whatever, that's what's happening. But as a kid, I can imagine feel did you did you feel that that those were side effects and they weren't good or was it more like i guess it's just what i got to deal with or how did you uh, I, know, I felt uh, like them? it was just something that i had to deal with like i this became used to the agitation i became used to not being hungry um mm. but i just the main thing is i felt like i can't go to school unless I take this because otherwise there's no chance in hell that I'm going to pass these tests. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in essence, you could say that uh, the pro medication folks would at this point say, see, it worked, right? In other words, uh, stimulant medication works uh, to focus someone, to have them pay attention in that moment, right? To not get distracted. Now I I'm just going to dive in there because sometimes I wait a little longer, but we're right there. Do you, what do you think uh, seven, eight year old Whitney was indeed distracted by in life? If we consider that, and this is our point of view, that it's not a disorder, but the prefrontal cortex, part of the brain has been hijacked to process something other than academic information, right? So, what was going on in your life uh, that you think had you distracted, quote unquote? Mm, definitely insecurities about, so I have a little brother and my little brother's 
less than two years younger than I am, he was always smarter than I was. Mm. And so I always had that insecurity and in trying to keep up with him. Mm-hmm. And that probably was a huge setback and could have been handled in a different fashion than medication. And was it, uh, do, do you feel that there was, obviously there's that competition, but did you ever feel like, did it come across as in like, I'm stupid, he's smart? Is that kind of? Constantly, because I was constantly called dumb. Mm. My mm. entire childhood, I was called dumb by my little brother or like even sometimes my parents would be helping me with my homework and my dad was like always my biggest supporter and best friend. But I remember there would be times be like, God, why don't you just get it? Mm. And I just didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> like I needed hours on homework because I would have to sit there and do problems over and over again until I could even understand it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, during that time where your parents, uh, your parents were together, all was well in the family. There wasn't any divorce or anything. No, nope, disruption. Good. Yeah. And what about what was your birth like? Was it smooth, natural, C-section? Because those are all things that uh, often affect the child's nervous system. And, you know, so I always try to see. It was the- a C-section. I don't remember if it was an emergency C-section. That's a good question. I should ask my mother. Yeah, because what we're finding is that a lot of medical trauma, like uh, abrupt, uh, what do you call it, abrasive C-section, you know, emergency C-sections, or even C-sections in general, when when the child is very sensitive, that could be enough to like make them feel unsafe as they're born, and then they're just always more concerned with everything but like what they need to focus on. Right? It's kind of a theory that we're discovering. Not not our theory, but uh, a lot of experts point that way so i was just curious but yeah it might be good to find out um but i get so there was that definitely that competition that feeling starting to uh run that inner dialogue that you're not smart and and you know kids will just say i'm stupid they don't say i'm not smart it's like i'm stupid i must be stupid right so you carried that forward and then the adderall helped did you feel more like smarter because you started getting better grades and did the homework or how did that unfold uh, I never got great grades ever. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I was a C average, maybe a C plus student my entire life. Um, so it at least got me to help me pass my classes, but, um, yeah, it still took a lot of work and hours upon hours of tutoring to get me to pass though. Well, my suspicion here is that you're just the, the, the learning, the learning style that that education where you went to provided isn't, wasn't really the way you enjoyed learning or that's not really how you were into taking in information, right? Um, what, assuming what were your favorite subjects in school? Science. Hmm. Definitely science. My least favorite was math. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I was more hands-on, like I always yeah. like the projects of getting to touch and visualize what was going on or what I was learning. Right. So you're more of a touch and see, mm-hmm. right. And a lot of the education is just writing stuff down and memorizing and, you know, um, so that was going to be my next suspicion. Usually it's the education, the style of education at the time that becomes a friction because it's not how you learn. And so, like you said, I never got good grades. Well, yeah, because you're in a system that doesn't, didn't really inspire you or motivate you to, to learn and to get good grades, right? A lot of kids have that. Um, so now you're, you're on medication, though. Your parents feel decent because at least you're getting by, right? And then how did you end up? You, you chose to go to college or did you, or was it suggested or how did you end up going to college? It was suggested that I go to college. (laughs) Yay, you and me both. (laughs) Uh, It was what my parents wanted for me. It was super important for my dad and my entire family. Because I was actually, so 
I was, I was the very first Jude to graduate college. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. That, is a, that is a big achievement. You know, even if you didn't want it, I mean, yeah. 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 Besides like my dad and my uncles, I was the first grandchild. And so that was important to my dad. And he always thought that a college education was super important so that you could grow up and find your perfect corporate world job and excel. <laughs> Well, that, that part didn't work out yet. <laughs> no. but, <laughs> I know if my dad was still alive, he would be very, so he would be my number one supporter and let me do whatever I want to do. But back then, I mean, 10 years ago, that was the route to take. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think still today, you know, we see so many parents still um, idolizing or praying to this Ivy League track carrot on a stick right and they're just like that's the way to go and we're finding out that it's all falling apart and it's actually funny but about 75 percent of all of people with adhd end up being entrepreneurs because that's what they they like to run their own business like yourself you know mm -hmm. set your own set your own hours you can come up with crazy ideas and trout and so no wonder i mean i can kind of see the pattern why you just didn't fit into that system because you were more destined for doing your own thing. Yep. You know, so you're in college and then um, you had mentioned in, uh, your dad passed away during that time. He passed away my second year of college. I was 22. Wow. That's a young, that's a young age to, I mean, obviously some are younger, but uh, when you're in college and at that age to deal with a loss like that, how did that, how did that affect you? I mean, in general, and then as well as where you were at in college and on medication still, right? I was, I was, um, I, yeah, I lost him in a car accident and it was, it was devastating, but I still finished school because my aunt, his big sister made me, she was like, I'm paying for this now. She was like, you have to stay in the school. Wow. <laughs> and, um, nice. She was super supportive, even though I did take some time off and my teachers were supportive of that, but I knew how badly he wanted me to finish school that wow. I had to, even though I did a crappy business degree, <laughs> the easy way out, it was still what he wanted. And so that was important for me to do that for him to honor that wish yeah that's yeah. beautiful yeah yeah and so let's fast forward so you graduate did you literally graduate and then drop drop the Adderall or was it uh, a bit more of a did it lead to something else that then had you stop it or how did that come about um so I actually had I ended up weaning myself off but I my first time dabbling in drugs. I was 13. And, um, so I was still on Adderall uh, when, when you tried other drugs. Yeah. Besides Let's go there. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so why, why did you, or how did, how did that unfold? Was it, uh, tell me about that. Um, so I was 13. What well, I was in eighth grade. I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. So I was still kind of just I've always was just, I never had like that super popular group of friends. Like I was the person who was friends with everybody. And, but I ended up started hanging out with the wrong crowd. And that's where weed was first introduced to me. And then two years later, mushrooms were introduced to me. And then right around that time, cocaine was introduced Oh, wow. From mm -hmm. mushroom to cocaine. Oh, that's intense. Yeah. And then it was a downward spiral from there. <laughs> and this is at 13? Um, this was probably like 15, 15, 16. 15, 16. And yeah. downward, how, how far down did that spiral go? Eight years. Eight years of consistent use? Pretty consistent. Yeah. Wow. And what, what were the bottom, uh, sort of the, the, you know, the most bottom parts of those eight years that, that would start to maybe wake you up a little. Being arrested more times than I can count on two hands. Um, 
for, I was stealing to pay, sell things to pay for my drugs. Mm-hmm. I would, even though I was like, I was still in school, I was still held a job. I had a job since I was 16. Um, but I was just in constant trouble, mm. constantly trying to find my next high. I would, then I was still in college, still taking Adderall while doing drugs. It was just one big mess. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, you know, there's, there's studies that claim that um, children on stimulant um, drugs are less likely to uh, try other drugs, but basically how they form, how they um, say it is if children with ADHD are, are not medicated, they will self-medicate. And we found a study that unfortunately didn't get published, but it was a 30-year study that proved exactly the opposite. So what you're saying, it's kind of like, it's a little bit easier to start doing drugs when you're already on something that you know makes you feel better. And it's, a, it's an external thing you take, a pill. So if somebody says, well, try this pill instead, and it might even feel better, right? Chill, whatever, mm-hmm. you're, in, you're, you're in. Again, I don't want to lead you here, but but did you feel it was easier to get into drugs because you were already kind of used to a dependency or perhaps not? I don't know. Um, I never really thought about it like that, but yeah, I mean, I was already taking something that said on the bottle amphetamine. So what's the difference between that amphetamine and another? Did you think that back then or are you thinking that now? I think that I thought that back then whenever I was a teenager, like I knew that I liked the up feeling. Yeah. Especially coming from I'm stupid and I'm depressed. Yeah. And now you're powerful and up and you can keep up with the Joneses, right? Or the students. Exactly. That, that's amazing. So eight years. Wow. So your body really took a beating and, and thank God it all worked out because that's a lot of drugs, right? It was too much. Now, let me ask you something. This might be a slight detour, but it's all part of the the conversation. Me as a parent, I have two boys. You know, I'm I'm starting to see the importance of really connecting with them. It's not just spending time with them, but quality time where we're being connected and we're really um, there for each other. Do you feel that perhaps there was a lack of that in your childhood? Or what do you think had you dive so deeply into uh, drugs and sort of hanging out with the wrong people. If, if you look back now, do you see any anything that, and it's not to blame your parents. I mean, your parents did the best they could, but I'm always curious when there's, you know, two parents and siblings and the family still together and all seems well, like, was there a disconnect of, of anything that you now see could have made a difference for you to not go there? Uh, looking back, it was mostly rebelling against my mother. Mm. Um, she was always so hard on me and pushed me. And I felt like she kind of pushed me in the wrong way. Um, and I always felt like I could never please her because she was so straight laced and never touched a cigarette in her life. And I was like, you don't get it. But then there's my dad who was like, she's going to go out there and she's going to do stupid things, be supportive of it and be there for her. And my dad's motto is shit happens. She's going to get in trouble. They're going to go out there and do stupid things. So I feel like a lot of my teenage years was to piss my mother off. Mm. So it was the kind of a helicopter parenting or the, or even, I guess, more so breathing down your neck and, and really, like you said, pushing the wrong way. Was it kind of like, because we had a similar experience just recently with uh, my boy's grandmother who just out of habit, you know, she's always correcting people and you got to wash your hands and you got to do this and close your mouth when you eat. And it was like constant, right? And the other day, uh, my son who plays video games and he's the one that, that was diagnosed with ADHD and you know it's been COVID and he's more home he can't play soccer with his teammates so he's gained a little bit of weight like around his weight but you know he's a, he's a tall kid 
and and I think she said something like, wow, you're getting fat, right? And I saw him kind of go like, um, wait, but I'm, I'm doing really good with eating and, I'm, you know, he's, he's eating a healthy diet. So those kind of like, uh, what is it called? The, the shaming attempts at like trying to get a kid to actually eat better or work out, but it backfires because you're calling them fat or stupid or whatever. So you can kind of relate to that. So you think too much of that was kind of like, it was like a F you. I'm going to go do my own thing, be my own person. Yeah. And I was always an independent kid. I remember her telling me that I never wanted to cuddle with her. I was never a huggy, lovey mm. child with her. More, I was more so with my dad, I think. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I think that it was, I don't know, part of me maybe even looks back like, she could have resented me a little bit because of that. Like my little brother, he was always mama's little boy and I was not mama's little girl. <laughs> mm. Yeah. We have something similar. Yeah. The oldest is also not usually very huggy and now he's more clingy and, you know, uh, it took something, but he was definitely not a, he was very independent, you know, which is fine. There's just some people that are like that, you know, that are more, I don't know, driven, entrepreneurial, driven, go, 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 you know? I was always an independent kid. I was okay. Yeah, I still am. I'm still very independent. Mm. Good. Now, what had you, uh, you said you weaned yourself off. What made you, what, what had you make that decision? Um, and, and was that, that was while you're still doing drugs or you have, what came first? What did you decide to um, stop? It was, it kind of all happened around the same time. I was in my late teens, early twenties. I had gone to my doctor and I sat down with her and I was like, I said, Dr. Rao. And I was like, I really want to get off of the antidepressants. They had also put me on sleeping pills. So I was addicted to Ambien and the Adderall. And so I was like, I, I don't feel like I need this. I had also kind of started working out at that time. So I felt like the working out was helping with my focus, with my depression and all of it. And mm. she helped me wean off and it took a long time. I remember that. The weaning off? Mm -hmm, of the prescription drugs. Yes. So it was just like less and less and less and less mm -hmm. until zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you were done, you were what now? Mid twenties? No, probably or early twenties. It was before I got off of the prescription drugs, except for the, I think I still kept the Adderall actually could to get me through college, but I got off of the sleeping pills and the antidepressants in my late teens, maybe 20 years old. I kept the Adderall to help get me mm -hmm. through college. Got it. Yep. That's a very common thing. And was, did you have any health issues, any side effects during those, what, 10 years, 19 years, almost on medication? No. Wow. Not Good that body. I know of. I'm, I mean, to this day, I'm incredibly healthy. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's I'm lucky. <laughs> you know, we all had our stints with medication. I had some, and you know, not a not a long time. But I'm also very fortunate that nothing happened. And some people, bad things happen. And but you were, I mean, you it seems like you were on three medications, right? Mm -hmm. Throughout college. And then when you did drugs, it was all on top of all three. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, it's amazing sometimes what the human body can withstand or, or just take in and still function, you know? Absolutely. It was it's pretty amazing what I put my body through and that it's still here holding me up and healthy. And now, how did your mom specifically react to, did they know everything that was going on during the college years? Or how did, you know, if it's kind of like, I'll stick it to my mom or try to get away from that 
that kind of pushing you in the wrong direction. How did your parents react? Uh, they tried their hardest to support me the best that they could. I mean, anytime that I ever got in trouble, I called my dad because my dad was always there to bail me out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my mom was like, let her sit. And then when you would come home with your dad or whoever picked you up, would you then, would your mom lose it? Would she? Most of the time, yeah. Would you have it or would you? She uh, would your just, dad would sort of. Yeah, I mean, she would lose it. We would get in a huge match scream fight. And then I don't do well with screaming. So mm -hmm. I would normally just get up and walk away and go to my room or wherever. And then a little while later, my dad would end up coming and talking to me in my room privately because we could actually have a conversation and it wouldn't turn into screaming like it did with my mom. Got it. And who do you think, this is a funny question I ask once in a while when it's appropriate, who do you think was wearing the pants in the family? I feel like my dad had things more under control than my mom did. I felt like he was more yeah. supportive. Like he knew, I felt like he knew better the type of support that I needed than my uh, mother. And, and, and in disciplining though, would, would you say it's your mother that would sort of reactively discipline? She would definitely reactively discipline. I mean, yes, my dad still disciplined us. Okay. But it wasn't as harsh. Yeah. It was like, okay, you fucked up. It's time. You got to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Conversation. And my mom was like, you're so freaking stupid. And why do you always have to go out there and do all these dumb things? And <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm asking because I had a similar thing where my mom was always the one yelling and she's she's the one that whooped us with a, what do you call those uh, that they used to hit the carpets with outside to get the dust out? Oh, yeah. What are those called? I don't Carpet know. Hitters? I don't know. Smack a booty hitter. But they were made out of like rattan, you know, wood, like intricately woven and we would get, and it was always my mom. My dad would be very calm and it was like, yeah, you shouldn't do that, you know, obviously. And he was just very civil and calm. And my mom just lost it. She was just like, that was her, probably how she was raised. Mm -hmm. you know? And maybe, maybe her mom was like that. And the dad was like, eh, whatever. You know, it sounds like your dad had more of an uh, involvement, though, in terms of having constructive conversations. Yeah, he did. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. And so when, when, um, when you weaned off the, the Adderall, that was purely your decision. Mm -hmm. And did you, was it like, Hey parents, I'm done with this thing. I'm going to get off it. I think I was kind of like my own adult at that time, finishing up college at what, 24. And I was yeah. like, okay, I don't need this stuff anymore. And I didn't like the way I was trying, like I would take it for classes and I would try my hardest not to take it on my off days or on the weekends. Um, because I didn't like the way it made me, I was starting to not like the way it made me feel. I didn't like feeling that cracked out feeling all the time. And I didn't like grinding my teeth and not having an appetite. Yeah. That's what I hear a lot. People lose weight, don't eat, you know, it's like a, people use it as a diet. It's like the Adderall diet. Yeah. You know, they still do today. <laughs> they still do. <laughs> I know it still works, you know? Yep. Um, and, and how did you, did you ever sell it? Did you ever give it to people? Were you ever like here? I have too many, take some share, share, good, share in the good fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause it was a college thing, right? It was probably yep. pretty rampant. People were like, you have Adderall, I'll give you $10 or $20 for one pill. And I'm like, bam. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did it, how many kids would you say were on Adderall or, or around you just from a guess? Oh my gosh. I would say probably 
half of them over mm-hmm. half of them, especially in college, like high school, college, they all, everybody was trying to find something. All with the intention to pay attention, focus, learn, get good grades, move on to the next school. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Get to, get to the top with the pill. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Interesting, Whitney. Well, I'm just really um, amazed by the strength of a your body and your mind that you made it through, and that you you know trusted that you you still have it without any external um, supplements or stimulants, right? Absolutely. Um, was that after you weaned yourself off? Was there like a a period of kind of you know, doubting that you could without it now, or were you just done and you're moving on and everything was fine? Or was there like a transition period mentally, not the physical, but like, um, mentally there was definitely a period of like, Oh my gosh, I don't know if I can get through my shift at work without that. Um, but I knew that if I took it, I wouldn't like the way that I felt. So I chose not to take it. And I chose to just kind of push through and I used, I tr- put my focus into the gym. Hmm. And at, when you say make it through at work, was it because you couldn't focus on the little minutia tasks or just simply the day was long and you had, you know, uh, the day was long. Or what what was always- hard to make it through the day? Yeah. I mean, I was uh, in the service industry and so I was working sometimes double shifts or late night shifts and I'm like, gosh, how am I going to get through this night without some type of stimulant or something? But that's also whenever I was using cocaine up until early, early twenties. So wait, so you're saying my waitress was on cocaine? Most likely. <laughs> oh probably, a lot of them still are today. <laughs> like, hey guys, would you like a soup of the day? What's the soup of the day? Cream of who fucking cares? Moving on next. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's funny. Wow. Um, what about coffee? Does, did coffee ever work for you? I didn't start drinking coffee until my mid 20s. I didn't like it. Yeah, it's not the, now I like it, but it's so bitter. At the time, I'm sitting here. I was like, yeah, why would anybody drink this? Yeah. Now it's buckets. Buckets um, of coffee. <laughs> buckets, big buckets, you know, with the big the <laughs> straw, the long straws. So everybody can join in. Um, they should do that. They should have a coffee bar where you have like a big bucket of, of you know, like uh, iced frappuccino. And then you get the big straws and people kind of like at the bars when they do that with like margaritas. Um, anyway, so now... Uh, I had a question. Let me see if I can remember it. It was in regards. Oh, we talked about coffee as a stimulant. Did you ever have other supplements or anything else that your parents tried or you tried during the earlier uh, ADD phase, like when you were diagnosed or did it pretty much go to the meds fairly quickly? It was pretty much straight on to the meds. Do you remember was there? Well, I mean, you were really young, so I don't know if you remember or, or if you know what your parents went through but did they ever talk about perhaps why they did that so quickly or was there just nothing available other than that or what do you think i don't think they knew better Mm. so they just educated mm. on exactly what the disorder was or what could fix it like if it was an active lifestyle or if it was my nutrition that wasn't that great at the time or what other type of herbal supplements out there could have potentially worked. I don't think that that information was readily available 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and also obviously they, you know, like so many parents, they listen to the loudest narrative because the loudest narrative is the the most funded narrative, right? It makes sense from an advertising point of view, it's just business. So they listened to that because they obviously wanted to help you and loved you. Right. So Mm -hmm. Um, they did the best they could. I was going to make sure that his parents really, they, most of them really want the best for the kids, you know? So in essence, we thank your parents, right? I do. <laughs> um, I <thank> them. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, like I said, they did the best they could. Um, how are you, uh, 
ask, you know, today, right? You're an adult. You're someone who runs your own business. You're about to get married. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, five years, right? Has been. It will, be, will be. Will be five years. Very cool. Um, I wanted to know now looking back, what do you think, what do you personally think of? And this, if you can sort of disregard me reaching out to you uh, about my project, this podcast, what did you as an adult now looking back, think of ADHD? What is it? And what did you really go through? And did you have it or something? Or what, what's your general um, take on this so-called disorder? Uh, I think that looking back, it would be super important for the parent to try a different route first. And that route for me personally, I wish that my parents would have completely changed my diet and taken away sugars and all the processed carbs um, and made me play sports because that's something that I wasn't they tried to put me in sports and extracurricular activities. I never did well. I never excelled. So they just kind of gave up on it. Um, I wish they would have continued to try to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but even to this day, I noticed that my, my ADD of today is very different, but that's because I have changed my diet. I don't eat a ton of processed sugars. And whenever I do, I notice how I feel and how my brain feels. Um, Mm. And I do realize that if I don't get to work out for a couple of days, that I get kind kind of antsy and my mood changes. So I know that I need to go work out because that's going to help boost my mood naturally. That's, that's really well said. Yeah. Something there hit me hard because our son also, you know, we've had him in sports and he quit and we had him in sport and he's not great. He's kind of, he's a little clumsy, you know, but he's cute. He plays soccer and he's like doing his thing, but we were like, yeah, maybe he doesn't like soccer. And now because of COVID there's nothing other than, hiking or walking with a dog or bicycle riding. I mean, by nothing, I mean, there's stuff, but I feel like he needs that little that push to, to, cause he loved the gym when he was like nine, nine years old. He's like, I want to come to the gym and work out. And nobody would let him in the gym cause he's too young, but he was like ready, you know? So I feel like maybe I should look into that, create a little gym here, you know, cause he really wanted to do something. And so when you said that, I was just like, wow, we're doing the diet right now. We're shifting it. And he's been great at letting go of the process stuff and sports is next. So I really appreciate that. Um, that, that reflection, um, yeah. to take, take that to the family today. Even if it's not a sport, something that I currently do is box. Oh, it's been a huge game changer. I started working, training my clients out of a boxing gym and I do privates now and I also do classes and that has been a huge benefit to me the last year because it gives me something to focus on because I have to remember the numbers. I have to remember the moves and my form and everything that goes into it because it is so much. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you found a gym that you can go to that has the boxing bag. Yep. I'll have to look into that. I'm not sure if we have anything in town. It's a small town, but. Um, look into it. Even if it's like a private, like doing privates with a person and doing mitt work. Yeah. It's, or, or maybe we could have one here, uh, you know, and, and I can do it with, with Kai. Yeah. Or outside, get a pole or something. There's plenty of videos out there to teach you your form and footwork and everything that goes into it. Nice. Yeah. I like it. See, I'm getting some tips right here <laughs> from my, from my expert. Yeah, um, sure. Anything else that you want to say, perhaps this might be and you did some of that already, but t- talking to whether it's young uh, girls, usually majority are boys, but young, you know, children, 
uh, or, or for the parents listening, what, how they could be seen or, or treated or uh, I guess treated in life as someone with what we call a disorder, uh, that's debatable, but any suggestions um, perhaps for parents how to, you know, make, uh, make the family fulfilled, not divided or united, not divided, right? Um, yeah, I mean, be patient with them because that attention or whatever they're struggling with, if you see it as ADD, it's probably rooted as something else. Um, and so just be patient and dig, but dig gently, because if you can get to it at a younger age, you can save yourself years and years of heartache. Cause I put myself through many, many years and my parents, many years of heartache. So just being patient and trying alternative routes to treat whatever has, whatever is going on. Great. I like that. I like that. And again, you know, as we're wrapping this up, I just, uh, I want to make sure people understand, first of all, parents do the best they can. Uh, sometimes we do need a band aid because we have, you know, parents have three jobs and they can't function unless the kid doesn't get called into the principal's office again, you know, three, three days a week. So, sometimes there's band-aids and I think you're also to me very much approved that not only can you quote unquote outgrow it as in you can find ways to I hate to use the word coping because it doesn't seem you don't seem to me like a coping person and I want to don't want to assume but to me I believe that you're not coping with it you outgrew it and you've created a life with your business and, and the, the type of business that you're doing, that you're in is that it's actually working for you. Like it's your path. It's your, how you like to interact with the world. So there's no friction. Right. Yep. And that to me is definitely a sign of, uh, you know, that you turned out that you've become, as we say, a responsible adult, right? You can function in the world, pay your bills, you're about to get married, you have your own business. To me, that is a success story, right? Where you go from here is up to you. You can create more financial success, more business success, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I would here say that you're pretty fulfilled in life right now compared to back then. Would that be correct? A hundred percent. I didn't want to lead the witness, but you know, uh, that's really cool. Well, look, I appreciate your, um, your honesty and, and vulnerability and your willingness to go, go down that back there. Right. And kind of dig it up a bit. And, and, uh, I'm excited to see what, what difference this podcast can make. Cause once in a while we'll get an email from someone saying, wow, I love this podcast. My daughter listened to it. And, you know, that's why I do this not just to hear myself talk or interview people, but to make a difference. And I have no doubt it will make a difference for someone out there. So I really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with me. It was my pleasure. And I'm so happy to have been here to be able to share my story and hopefully have that impact, even if it's just that one person. Yay. Well, maybe we'll do a follow-up sometime after you're married. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> down the road, we'll, we'll talk more about fitness, but, uh, Thank you, Whitney. I appreciate it. Thank you.